like to introduce our guest for this evening. I can do that. So Dave Warnock was caught up in the Jesus movement of the 70s. He even considered himself a Jesus freak. He lived the bulk of his life as a charismatic evangelical serving as a pastor on three different church staffs. Following several years of internal struggle, Dave came to the conclusion in 2011, that was, that he no longer believed in a personal God. In 2019, he was diagnosed with ALS, which is commonly called Lou Gehrig's disease. That's a progressive a neurodegenerative disease with typically three to four year life expectancy. Dave is spending the days he has left speaking out about the dangers and harm of fundamental religions with a focus on his own past one, evangelical Christianity. He also seeks to provide a safe haven to those questioning their faith, recovering from religious trauma, or navigating life's tribunals, tribulations, <laughs> tribulations, as he shared his own perspective as a former ex-evangelical, but now an atheist facing a terminal diagnosis. He's a celebrated public speaker, host of the podcast Dying Out Loud, co-founder of the nonprofit I Am Dying Out Loud, and author of the memoir we've mentioned, Childish Things. Welcome, Dave. Thanks for joining us again. Hello, I, I oversee tribunals too, so we're good. <laughs> yeah, I do all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. It's good to be here, everybody. Thank you for doing this again, Dave. We love having oh, you. It's so my thank you so so much. So so this is your third time, is that correct? I think it is. Yeah. yeah you guys yeah. for some weird reason keep having me back. I, I would think you would learn to, to stop that. <laughs> it's your charming personality, man. I, it, must be, <laughs> it must be something. I don't know. So well, we're we're glad you can do this. So uh, you, you told your story a lot and even wrote a, about a book about it. Uh -huh. But for those who haven't heard it before, can you give us a description of your religious background in some more detail than I read there and your deconversion and deconstruction journey? Yeah, um, the brief synopsis is that I was a, I, I was caught up in the Jesus movement of the 70s. Uh, a lot of you are too young to know what that was, but it was a it was a real thing. I mean, Jesus was on the cover of Time magazine. I mean, the actual picture of Jesus, because they have evidence that of exactly what he looked like. And um, they had a picture on the cover of Time magazine. White, white dude, blue eyes. Yeah, white, white hair. I was going to say, white dude. <laughs> blonde, white guy, blonde hair, blue eyes. I mean, very Nordic looking, which was surprising to me. He, he didn't stand out at all when he was in the Middle East. No, not at all. Um, you know, Jesus Christ Superstar was a big thing. Um, the Doobie Brothers were singing about Jesus is just all right. What was a so I got swept up in all of that because it was a really big deal. And I stayed in it for three and a half decades. And um, I don't know, you know, like you said in the intro, it was a series of of questions without answers and a lot of soul searching and uh, really introspection and, and, and going through more questions than I'd ever asked, allowed myself to ask before that led me out of it in uh early the early two uh, two tens you know tw 2011 or so i don't have an exact date when i deconverted but that's the gist of it i actually got a call from a guy today he he left a voicemail he he wants to talk to me about a small part in a documentary because he said i heard about your i understand you were a jesus freak and you're now an outspoken atheist and so the documentary he said is supposed to be called aborting god and i thought Ooh. Okay, I want to be a part of this. <laughs> so <laughs> that just happened today. I don't know what's going to come of it, but we haven't talked, but that's kind of the gist of that. But yeah, I just, I, I've said it several times, but I essentially got tired of making excuses for God's poor behavior. And I got, I, I just ran out of reasons to believe. And I just got exhausted with, with trying to make it make sense. And that's what I think a lot of Christians do. They work so hard. The Christians are doing all the work. God ain't doing shit. And the Christians are doing all the praying. They're doing all the studying. They're doing all the quiet times. They're doing all the conferences. They're doing all the uh, retreats. They're doing all of this stuff. And God's just nowhere to be found. And I just really, I think I just got tired of that. And uh, when, I, when I started investigating whether, mm -hmm. whether I believed in this God at all, I really, it, I, it, when I found out the, when I came to the conclusion that the Bible was not inerrant and inspired. I mean, everything ab about my faith rested upon the veracity of that book. 
And when I preached, it was all out of the Bible. It was very, uh, it, I was very cerebral in my approach to the, to the faith. And so when that didn't make sense anymore, the rest of it, you know, fell like dominoes. So, so and, do you remember your, your thoughts at the time while, while you were still a pastor about the problems with Christianity pointed out by atheists and, but, you know, but apologists, you know, always explain. I never way, talked like to the, God, the problem of evil or the gods. No, goodness. I never, never, you, you don't really, many of you do, but a lot of people don't realize what a bubble you live in. I didn't know a mm -hmm. single atheist. I never talked to atheists. I never asked those questions. I never heard of apologetics. I never, there weren't YouTube shows like the atheist experience and dying out loud, which is now the best show on the internet. It is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is clearly. <laughs> uh, everybody says so. Um, I, I even promoted over my own show. That's and, okay. And, it, <laughs> and in fact, I have a wonderful guest host tomorrow night, the, the one and only Glinda Jordan. Whoa. is going to join me tomorrow Our night. Very Glinda. Yay. So <laughs> there weren't shows like that out there. I mean, you couldn't. So when you live in your in a bubble like that and everyone you know thinks the same way you do, you don't you're never confronted with with these real questions. I mean, yeah, I've got doubts, you know, and well, God will answer your doubts and don't worry, he's he's there for you. But you never allowed yourself to ask the hard questions. Nobody was asking the hard questions in our circles. And so you can go a lot of years and never really deal with with existential questions or things that don't add up and having to really struggle with the whole God concept altogether. So, you know, that was just not a thing that I was even familiar with. And even when I started deconstructing, I had a hard time finding anyone to talk to about it, finding anyone, anyone that could relate. I felt incredibly alone, wondering if anybody else had ever gone through this, wondering if I was crazy. I, it was very disorienting for a couple of years, actually. I know that, like, when I was listening to your um, audiobook, um, you said something about, like, you know, you, you had, you just thought that other religions were wrong, you know, that you oh, had yeah. the right, um, that you all have just figured it out, and this was the correct one. But also, you didn't seem resentful or angry at other religions, um, compared to some other pastors. <laughs> You know, so, in recent but, but history. So up, I was just curious, that, like, you yeah. know, where where that kind of did, perception came from. Did, did you think everyone else was going to hell that wasn't in your particular denomination? Theoretically, yes. Theologically, I did believe in the concept of heaven and hell. You have to. That's that's part of the fabric of your faith. And so I found myself increasingly believing theologically things that I had trouble with emotionally or intellectually, but I would still maintain, I mean, I would have a hard time telling someone they're going to hell, or if they ask me point blank, which I've done to people since I've been on this side of the of the bridge, I've done that to people. So you think I'm going to hell when I die. I've made them answer the question point blank. And it's really hard for folks to personalize it. It's very right. easy to generalize. Yeah, people who don't accept Jesus you know, that's the penalty for our sins because we're born into sin. You know, you know the, the rhetoric. And so I believed it theologically, but I, I didn't go around thinking, you know, and talking about hell a lot because it was a very uncomfortable subject for me. Um, I The faith that we practice wasn't Bible thumping, hellfire and brimstone judgment kind of faith. It was more about what God wants to do in your life, how God wants to make you better and help you help you in your marriage, help you with your kids, help you with your job, you know, to to walk in your life with you. Again, although I'm doing all the work, he's getting all the credit, but it wasn't a lot of noise about hell. And so theologically, I did believe that people who did not practice not just my faith, but didn't. They didn't pray the prayer of salvation they weren't born again they didn't receive jesus as lord and savior and they didn't live according to that i did believe that they were wrong and unfortunately hey i didn't write the rules you go to the bad place when you die sorry were you uh into the rapture stuff yep any day now hmm. for 35 years <laughs> yeah day. i noticed your brother was really into that 
Like oh, yeah. he, he, he was like, it's going to come any day, man. Jeez, just wait. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's what we thought. And now obviously, you know, when I, in 1974, I was saved radically on Christmas, the day after Christmas, 1973. That's, I mean, I had a time, a, a date, time and date stamp of my new birth. And so 74, 75, 76, those were the heady Jesus freak days. And it was, it was very much in the air. It was like uh, the most popular Christian book was Late Great Planet Earth, Hal Lindsey. And it's all about mm -hmm. how the end is coming in our generation. And any day now, Jesus is going to come snatch away uh, those of us who believe. And there's going to be, I mean, there were movies about it. And, uh, and, and so it's still uh, a concept very much in the forefront of many Christians thinking you just don't hear it talked about a lot, uh, I don't think, as much as it was back in the 70s. Because let's be honest, he we he was coming any day now, 40 fucking years ago. So he's kind of late. And it's and a lot of people are having trouble just coming to grips with, okay, Jesus, we we kind of been looking at our watch here. Maybe we need to look at a calendar now because um, it's just taken a long time. So it you, is funny, like when the apostles, you know, when he died, it's like, oh, the, it's going to come like right after he died. There, there are those of you here years will later, see this, like, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, pretzel logic and toe dancing around trying to explain certain passages like that. There's some of you who remain here alive who will, who will not die until the son of man comes in his glory. And you start trying to make excuses for what that, I, well, let me just tell you what that means. Let's go to the Greek. And, you know, you, you can always find reasons. Have you heard the one, what I think they call the wandering Jew, where like one of those people who was standing there listening to Jesus, it was immortal and is still walking around today. Therefore, uh, the quote, some yeah, of you is correct. I mean, that's that's <laughs> one of the more radical concepts. I have yeah. not heard that. And I oh, want yeah. to meet this person. <laughs> yeah. he, he's like a zombie, lives in a cave in the Middle East. And he's going <laughs> to pop out and say, hey, hey, Jesus, where you been? Yeah. It, it, you have to <laughs> You have to come up with some pretty wild ideas to make it all make sense. There's a there's an, thing? there's an Egyptian myth where there's a um, guy that's immortal and he lives as a pauper and he knows the secrets to like the chambers of Toth and he knows a bunch of other Egyptian secrets. So oh, yeah. I'm going to assume that most religions have a weird immortal person that's supposed to know everything about the gods or God. That's my uh, that's my theory. I don't know if it's true, but that's it makes my sense. hypothesis. <laughs> It makes sense. So about your evangelical background. Uh, mm -hmm. So I have relatives who, who converted from Catholicism uh, in the, I guess it was the 70s. And they were like the kind of people who went to church, you know, maybe Christmas and Easter. And then they became so devoutly fundamentalist Christian. Uh, uh, and they believe in things like exorcism, speaking in tongues, prophecy. Were you all into all of that too? Oh, Yeah. <laughs> did, did, did they perform oh, did they perform exorcisms in, in your church i we didn't call them that that was from a movie you know that's in fact there's a new one coming out i saw an ad for it yeah um but yeah, you know, with the catholics did exorcisms we just cast out devils um, that's the definition and what's, of it. what's the difference exactly <laughs> the definition. terminology it's it sounds different <laughs> i'm not doing an exorcism because they do the cross and they they splash them with some water and they hold up a cross and they do these incantations we just told them to leave in jesus name because uh, it's the name above okay. all names so Should yeah spoke in tongues <laughs> believed in miracles all that stuff did your church um, want them to get evaluated by like medical doctors and psychiatrists first or just be like, well, you know, you want to masturbate. So obviously you have a demon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cast out that demon. Uh, no, there were no medical doctors involved. We didn't, we didn't need that. God was telling us what was going on. Mm. I mean, I'm not saying that just because the, you know, the Catholic church did a little bit of due diligence. It wasn't harmful, but at least I can be like, well, they tried. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it was all very, fly by the seat of your pants kind of stuff it was all very what god is saying there weren't there wasn't a lot of accountability in terms of of what we did and how we did it it was all very freewheeling i mean we didn't belong to any denominations or anything it was just all evangelical churches that were started by people who had the calling and the anointing and they did what they wanted and called it god 
I see. Okay. That makes that makes sense. Um it's it's just like me and Rob have talked about this too. Um, we we both grew up Catholic, so we were coming from that weird mindset. And then we hear about like charismatic Christianity or evangelical or non-denominational, which just seems to be a hodgepodge of things, depending yeah. on which denomination you're talking to. So, so, <laughs> so. What, Helen, what did you think of when you heard that there were people like, like when my all my cousins changed? I thought like they were just insane. Like you know, they did everything, and I think Dave is this category too. He did not handle snakes. Some christians go that far yeah, that's right? crazy you didn't yeah that's crazy right yeah all the other stuff's not crazy but that's <laughs> but, crazy but i witnessed and people I speaking snakes. in tongues and rolling on the floor and being healed <laughs> yeah, by, by yeah. the minister it's like yeah, you guys all that's are all that's perfectly normal but snakes yeah, okay yeah. i draw the line there we've all got our are wonderful they're they're totally chill and awesome it just like you know i don't i'm just not agreed to like drugging and like the thing is that they drug them so they're actually able to handle them mm-hmm. um but I've also, they, sometimes they don't get enough of the drug, and sometimes they attack people because it's a snake. <laughs> well, they've been, yeah, they've died handling the snakes. There's, there's whole lineups of there's. I saw a documentary, and there's a whole three generations of preachers, and the two dads have mm-hmm. died from snake bites. Well, what is their apologetic for that? Like, why did there's a verse in the that? Bible that says you'll take up snakes and drink deadly poison, and it won't hurt you? No, no, no. But but, but, no, no. Why was it? Why were those people killed who were supposed to have enough faith? Test? Didn't have enough oh. faith. It's always oh, didn't have okay. enough faith. If you have enough faith, that's the whole thing. That's the testing of their faith. <sighs> they handle the Isn't there a get... phrase too to move mountains? Like you should be able to move mountains with your yeah. faith, blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah. Oh, like that hasn't happened. <laughs> no, not, not yet. Any <laughs> as far minute, as I any know. Minute now, though. Any minute now. Any minute. <laughs> um. So when I first heard of like, um, evangelicals and you know i'm um, charismatic christianity and baptists and methodists and you know um i was already pagan at the time and i was going through that deconstruction phase and it was just so weird to me because um when i had grown up it was mostly catholics and i had been friends with mormons and a couple of buddhists and then a couple of atheists but i was a teenager so i wasn't like having deep thoughts about like you know, philosophical questions. I was like, okay, fine. Because my parents had kind of had like the attitude that like, as long as they're good people, it doesn't matter. And I've always kind of adopted that pers- perspective. And I didn't find out about like the, the forms of Christianity until I moved down here and living in Florida. And I was just, and I, I kind of fell down this weird rabbit hole because it was so outside of anything that I had been exposed to. I had been exposed a little bit to the Baptist church when I was like 14, 15 years old, but I didn't have the context to really understand what the belief system was. Um, I was just kind of went because one of my friends was a Baptist. So when you don't have that context of that type of um, belief system, it seems a little crazy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, it is. Yeah. (laughs) It and is, but that was that was that was our normal world. And again, yeah. everyone in that world lives in an echo chamber, and they live in a bubble, and so they reinforce these ideas. Every that's why they go, go to church so often because you got to keep reinforcing mm-hmm. these ideas. You can't you can't let the flock stray. You know they call us sheep for a reason, and sheep will wander, and sheep are dumb, and sheep can constantly have to be herded and corralled and. And the shepherd can't let them get away because they'll go wander off a cliff or something stupid. And that's how we're viewed. And so they yeah. continually have to reinforce these concepts or we'll get out there and ask too many of the wrong questions of too many of the wrong people. So did you, when you were a pastor, did you keep track of who was there each week? And then if someone like missed a couple of weeks, like, hey, I didn't see you in church you know, yeah, the past couple weeks, is everything okay? How's your relationship with God? You know, <laughs> yeah, loosely, I would check on the flock if a sheep was wandering. Um, <laughs> not, not in a, not in a Gestapo way. You know, knock on the right. door. In three weeks, be more, be more what's up? about it. <laughs> we need your. T- we don't care if you come. Just send the tithe. Did um, you Did you ever face anyone who was on going? You know, leaving, thinking about leaving, having se- severe enough doubts to do what you eventually did before you did yourself. Um, I have since heard from some actually no, from I my mean, church, while but were, not while beforehand. Were, no, not while you were no, pastor, it never came up. No, ne- it never, it never, I never encountered it personally. Mm-hmm. Um, 
No, you just, you, you heard about people. I mean, you, you realize, oh, so-and-so hadn't been here in a while and, and you've heard they've quit going to church or whatever, but we just called that backsliding. That Not that you changed your belief about God, but that you were just uh, getting lazy in your walk with the Lord and you were mad at God or running from God or whatever. You were just backsliding and you needed to re, re uh, what do you call it? Um, recommit your life to God. And so we had a, a lot of times on the altar calls, it'd be people who'd been wandering away and they'd wandered astray and they came back up to the altar and they prayed to recommit their life to the Lord and double down and and so work people, harder and try harder and for pray. People who and fast. don't know, like Catholics, what, what's this altar call business? Oh, that's that's where you go and make get yourself right with God. It's up at the front. It's called the altar, and um, it's where you do business with God. So, does the minister like do this every service and ask people? Uh, to- some churches do, some don't. Uh, old school, it was more like yeah. At the end of the service, you bow your head and pray, and you lead. You know, you call people to the front if they want to receive the Lord or recommit their lives to the Lord or have a, they need prayer. A lot of times you'll have a, mm-hmm. you'll have the prayer team come up and people will come up for prayer. That's always a big thing. in most of the churches I was in is you, you have trained prayer uh, team and you know what to, how to, how to pray for folks. And then that's where some folks that get slain in the spirit. If you're really, if you're really, God, this sounds so weird, doesn't it? <laughs> Like, listen, I like oh, I was God. from a religion where people thought they were literally eating the blood and body of Christ. OK, so like now that's I've weird. learned to accept all types of crazy. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> like that's nothing crazy, sounds crazy. crazy to me. I'm like, that sounds like religion. Helen, <laughs> I, I actually think 95 percent of Catholics don't believe. That. I didn't believe that. When right. I I've argued with people my who parents... said, that's a stupid idea. Who would tell you that? I no, said, here's like, my the mom thing. That's the doctrine that. of the church. And they would we know always crazy. think. We always think the practices we're doing are right and normal and the practices everyone else doing are weird. So when I've always kind of, you know how people like, I have found in like these sort of denominations, like, you know, people give themselves up to Jesus and they're born again. Do you get people that are born and born again? Like, you know, like, well, I fucked up. I'm going to get born again. Like, instead of like, I feel like once you're born again, like you don't have to do it again. You just you say, I'm sorry. I had a bad week. No, that's what people, <laughs> that's where they kind of get. I've known people who got baptized again because they'd drifted away and wanted to kind of recommit their lives to the Lord and make a statement by getting baptized again. But I'm, you know, it's not, you know, theologically, technically, no, you can't be born again. You've already been born again. So let's just recommit our lives to the Lord and try harder. That's basically how we approached all that. I've heard the phrase "once saved, always saved," and that's not not yeah. uniformly understood to be true. But some Christian denominations say that. Is that right? Yeah, there. I mean, the Christians getting a knockdown, drag out fight about that. Uh, I had people in my church. You know, I I believed that you could lose your salvation, you could walk away from God, um, like I did. And you know, there are people who believe that. Once I was saved, then I'm locked in. Whether I want to go to heaven or not, by God, I'm going to heaven. And so you better just suck it up, Dave. You're going to wait. Wait, seriously? Anything. There's nothing you could do to break. Nothing I can do. Murder, mass murder people. And nothing I can do. Nothing wow. I can do to wow uh, to uh, discredit that. Um, wow. That's nonsense to me because the last place I want to spend eternity is in heaven, around the throne, singing Hosanna with a bunch of people like Mike Pence. I'm sorry, I just don't. And Pat so, Robertson and yeah. like Jerry Falwell, like, oh my so, God, eternity with. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing about Christianity, <laughs> even in the evangelical circles, you've got all these arguments about what the, what's the, the, the correct doctrine. And there's, that's why they have 6,000 denominations just of. How could this be Dave? The Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. How, how could that yeah. be? How's, How's that, that working? Book? How's that working? So when. I know that you went through like your deconversion process and I wasn't, I didn't um, catch this in the memoir. So if I missed something, you know, um, I apologize. But like when you were going through the process, I know that um, you were like a staunch believer, but like whenever you had a little bit of faltering, did you like go to one of your friends and be like, Hey, you know, um, I'm not seeing God in this, you know, um, and try to get reaffirmed when those doubts would crop up. (laughs) No, I I didn't have anyone that I felt like I could trust with that kind of question. Mm-hmm. I felt like I, I, I knew that anybody I went to was going to be part of the echo chamber and that all they were going to do 
was coax me back in to faith and help me mm -hmm. wrestle with my doubts. Um, I, I wanted to wrestle with this on my own. I, I didn't read any atheist books. I didn't, I just went through the Bible looking for consistencies. I uh, read some books about doubt and faith, but I didn't go to like Dawkins and Hitchens and, and read classic atheist books. Right. I, I just kind of spent a lot of time writing down my questions and putting things on a, on a pad and columns and, and sorting through it mentally myself. So um, I'm curious that like, I had a question, where'd it go? Let me catch up with it. Hold on. So <laughs> when you were going through um, that process though, like even when you're a pastor, like, did you kind of have to like compartmentalize like well I still gotta preach to the flock but also at the same time like be like well what am I saying might not be 100% true and how did you deal with contradictions because they're all over the place in the bible you know, yeah I didn't <laughs> I I wasn't pastoring I got fired from my last church for being I just got to that part today so oh, okay. <laughs> that's when I had to stop <laughs> being too independent and so I wasn't serving as a pastor when I really started doing the deconstruction work. Um, mm -hmm. Throughout my life, I had <clears throat> doubts or questions that would pop up along the way and and questions about consistency and things like that from the Bible. But there's, there's a lot of built-in um, excuses and allowances that are made. Uh, uh, you know, the default one is that there are things we don't understand now but that we will one day when when we see as we are seen and known as we are known. And we just have to trust that God has a bigger plan and we don't see everything clearly. We see through a glass darkly and we understand in part, we know in part. All these verses mm -hmm. are built in, they're baked into the pie so that any questions or doubts that you have about the authenticity and the consistency of the scriptures and of the faith can be explained away with that. And so you just never get to the point of pushing far enough against the edge to to push against those built in um, excuses, if you will. Like I was talking to a theist last week and I was kind of press pushing him because he was like, well, what if the contradictions can be like, you know, explained away? I said, because that's a post hoc explanation. I go, this is supposed to be the errant word of God. There should not be contradictions. And I said, so I'm like, if you're going to be intellectually honest, it 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 would match if this was not supposed to have any mistakes. And I I find that because I was never like I think like when I grew up Catholic, I wasn't a Bible literalist um, because Catholics don't view it that way. So um, that perspective is a little hard for me to grasp when you're looking at this book and see it like this. Everything in this book is fact. <laughs> Right, even right, with right. the contradictions, and, and there and there are no contradictions. Yeah, I had a religious coworker tell me that the Bible is is no contradictions at all. What are you talking about, Rob? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I could just spout them off the top of my head, fifty of them. Like, what are you talking about? There are no contradictions. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I did when I was deconstructing, one of the uh, pivotal exercises I did for myself, and this was, it may not sound consequential to any of you or or some of you, and it it doesn't to even some Christians because they can explain it away. But I looked at the four Gospels, and each each of the four Gospels have a different contradictory exactly. um, a view of what happened at the mm -hmm. at the tomb at the tomb, the resurrection. You know, who got to the tomb first? Who was there? Where was the angel? Was he inside? Was he outside? How many women were there? What were the first women? Who who did what? And all of these things contradict. There's not one parallel version of the Gospels about the resurrection story. And I, I I did that on a yellow pad, line, side by side in four columns, what mm -hmm. they each said. And I looked at that, and there's a part in the book that I I literally read that and looked at that and threw my pen across the wall, uh, room and hit the wall. Mm -hmm. And I was so angry that I'd been tricked. What made great. you start to think of doing this? I never I, I was come across this on their own. You'll have to read the book, Rob. I will. Uh, yeah, I read the book. Uh, or uh, I'll let you read it to me. I will let you. Read it. I, 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 I thought. Like, can, I thought okay, if like, that story, that's the pivotal story of the New Testament. That is 
as Paul said, without the resurrection, we, we, we're dead in our faith. If, if Christ be not raised, we are dead in our faith. That is the, that's the uh, complete center of the story. If they can't get that right, if that can't be factually corroborated with four different authors and they got the details of that wrong, what else is wrong? How can I trust any of this? And that really be became the thread that I began to pull that unraveled the whole thing. And here I am tonight uh, uh, from that moment. It's that crazy. But to me, it was that big of a deal. Yeah, and it should, I, I will it should say be though, to everyone. People bury it, though. Yeah, I will say, though, um, you're, the way you have kind of gone over your life and those moments where you, you were you kind of go back and you look at like, oh, this was the moment that I decided to, you know, become, you know, a believer and devote your life to Jesus at a time in your life when it's a transition period. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a young, you're a young man. It's the seventies, oh, <laughs> you know, all the Jesus freaks, the charismatic Christianity's taken off, you know, everybody's kind of like, yeah, like, and also too, like, you know, being a good looking man in the seventies, you know, there's, and there's your, there, that charismatic sort of uplifting. And also I, I like that you were honest about like, you know, your sexuality and, you know, struggling with that and mm -hmm. um, being a young man. And that's one thing I really appreciated because you, you explained why people, when they're going through those transition periods, why they may get drawn to religion were, um, you know, you weren't raised in the faith, you know, no. just a little bit spring more like, you know, a lot of people here have been, you know, so I thought that the way that you describe that point, like I was going through a tradition, I didn't have any direction and this gave me direction. And especially it was your brother that drew you into it. So that's that yeah. personal connection as well. It's, so I thought that was really helpful, you know, in the memoir. Yeah. I, I, my Jesus stole my twenties from me. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> When I should have been having all the fun. Should have been having have... all the kinky sex. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. So, I, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm still pissed about that. So, so do you do you ever get that comment from people who, who know you've left? And like a lot of people say this, that you just want to be an atheist because you want to sin. Oh, yeah. 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 I've heard that plenty. I just tell them I did plenty of sinning as a Christian, so I didn't have to do that. I mean, you can read my book and see I did all the sinning. I didn't have to go. Uh, leave my faith to sin. I, as in fact, as Christians, you you have a get out of jail free card. You can sin all you want, and then repent the next day, and you're good to go. Very, very true. As it, atheists, it you got to really deal with weird. the consequences. It's different. As an atheist, you deal with the consequences of your bad, bad choices, of your of your faults, of your failures. When you when you mess up, you have to own it. Truly, as a Christian, I believe many Christians. Are, feel more free to sin, if you will. I hate that word because it's a made up word, but more free to sin because they know all they have to do is pray and repent and God will forgive them and they're good to go. And and you also don't have to blame yourself because clearly the devil made you do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that was one thing, like when I was listening to your story that your congregation basically love bombed you when you came back. Um, yeah, that, yeah, and indeed. I, I, because I'm saying I'm like that's not healthy. <laughs> that was my brain. Because <laughs> plus, like, um, uh, like, did you did you catch outside, the part? Did you catch what? the part of no therapy whatsoever? Yeah, I thought that too, and I was like, <laughs> oh no. Here's a like, Bible verse and a prayer. You're good, Dave. Go. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. And 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 that was one of the things that really struck me about these. Um, you know, because like in the Catholic Church, you just confess your son to um, a priest and he forgives you. You don't have to do it in front of the congregation because for the most part, your life is entangled up within the church. Mm -hmm. And I found that everybody knew, but I like everybody had a, like a pre-meeting. It was like, OK, when Dave comes back, we're just going to accept him and love him. OK, we're going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> kind of it. yeah. If you haven't read the book, she's talking about the juicy parts where the sex yeah. comes in. So <laughs> Uh, but but yeah. I found the love More bombing a little bit disgusting because you weren't, I was just like, well, we're just automatically going to forgive him. But I have to imagine there are people in your congregation that had been through a similar experience and oh, yeah. were struggling with it, Very but they were like, yeah. well, you know, if he's off the hook, maybe I'm off the hook, you know, kind of, you know, that yeah, was kind of where my, it's a terrible my way went. to deal, yeah. it's a terrible way to deal with 
unfaithfulness in a marriage and broken vows mm -hmm. and things lies and it's a terrible way to to sweep that aside thinking that god's just going to handle it because you've asked him to and you've repented and you feel bad about it and instead of really dealing with it and because it, it never was really dealt with in a healthy way and it infected our whole marriage for many years i would imagine yeah yeah i had a fidelity with my ex-husband um on both of our sides and it, it did infect our marriage and we didn't go to therapy we didn't do all the stuff <laughs> You know, I, um, I did after, you know, um, you know, after I got out of that relationship. So I, yeah. I, I understand that, that feeling that you, as long as everybody around me loves me, then it sounds so bad. And then when you're alone and you're dealing with the guilt, cause you're an empathetic, caring human being mm -hmm. that you're like, oh, oh fuck. Like I actually have to do work now. So, you know, I really appreciate that honesty you know, um, when you were talking about it, like I really, really did. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I had several people that read the, uh, I sent uh, the script or not script, but the manuscript to several people, Daryl included to get a, um, a blurb written on the back. And I was for, of course, I always was nervous about what they would say back, you know, you know, I, was, I get this like, Oh, well, you know, it's, it's nice, but don't quit your day job kind of thing. Um, <laughs> But several of them said that, wow, I'm not sure I would have told all that, you know, and say, so you were honest, man. And then, well, I had, I had my, my uh, collaborator tell me that the first rule of writing a memoir is tell the fucking truth. Yeah. And, and well, that's the thing though, because I completely related to it. I was like, I've been there, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I completely related to it and understood your emotions and why it happened and all these different things. So like I, t and that's one thing that I really appreciated about it because this is a very, very, very common thing that people do, but mm -hmm. it's also so shameful that it is pushed into closets. And if, especially within Christian circles, you know, religious circles that you can't talk about it. And it's something that needs to we talked about like why infidelity happens, you know, especially within, you know, um, religious communities, because it happens a lot, but they're just like, yeah, we're not going to discuss this, discuss this though. God will forgive them, you know, but that's well, not big, dealing with the problems thing, within the marriage either. A big <laughs> thing that happens in evangelical circles. Yeah. And, and I know that the purity culture plays, plays into this because yeah. when you don't get a chance to, you know, sow your wild oats is a, is a, not the right phrase, but to, yeah. to live some life and experience some things and have some sexual partners and find out who you are and what you're like and what you want. And, and when you, when that's, when that is shut down because of purity culture and, and th that whole idea of saving yourself for marriage and only being with one person for life, that can open up a host of problems and right. does very, very often. It does it for everyone, but we're wired differently. And and some people just aren't wired to be that that one person, one person for life kind of. And especially if you didn't get a chance to in your early in your 20s and 30s to to live some life, to experiment, to experience who you are and what you want. And that's another great disservice that that purity culture does to us and causes things to blow up down the road. Yeah, that's the thing we're usually rallying against. One of the things we're usually rallying against on this program <laughs> yeah. is the, just the, the harm of purity. It's culture. horrible. It's horrible. Anyway, Rob, you had a question. I'm sorry. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, um, yeah, I'm wondering if if you want to talk a little bit about your uh, ALS diagnosis. Uh, my understanding is that happened in 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. can, can you talk a little bit about? Uh, so one of the things that was in the introduction was that it's usually a very short prognosis for living after the, the diagnosis. But you, you've been lucky in that regard because yours is a very slow progressing disease. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it's probably because of the residue of the prayers that have been in me for all ah. these years. It's the only thing I can attribute it to. Um, it's just the accumulation of prayers. That We're going to have to clip that audio section. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I have a very slow progressing form. If you see me moving around a lot in my chair, it's just my neck gets weak and I, my head gets, I get a big head and it's heavy. And so I have to rest it and lean back. And so it's hard to be comfortable for a long period of time in this chair. So that's due to the ALS. Um, yeah, it's a slow progressing form of, of the disease. I 
many people are diagnosed and dead within two years, within six months, within three years. And I didn't know when I got diagnosed in 2019, February 26th, I didn't know how long I had. And so I thought it might go fast. And so I really kind of started, that's when I started dying out loud and started traveling and speaking and doing a lot of the things that I'm doing now, thinking I've got limited time. Let's see what we can do with this and make the most of it. And and so that that became what I've what I'm doing now, uh, right out of the gate. Um, but I I thought I may have a couple of three good years. And to me, good years is the key term because I'm not interested in how long I can stay alive. I'm only interested in how long I can live. And there's a big difference between those two. So so when the quality of life becomes um, too compromised or too difficult or not what I'm satisfied with or not what I think is is sustainable for much longer then I'm, I'm not sure how much past that I'll want to stay but as long as I feel like I can contribute and be effective and 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 uh, do things that I number one that I like to do because I get to decide what I want to do it's my story and I'll write it the way I want to write it and when I've <clears throat> when as long as I'm doing the things that I feel like have value and that I'm contributing to people around me, including my partner Bevan and my friends and people like you getting on shows and doing things, traveling. I do, I do a lot of traveling and speaking. And I find value in that. And I I get feedback from people that they find value in it. So to me, that's a win. And uh as long as the wins are outnumbering the losses, then I'm okay with continuing on um but the losses will mount up and they will become life will become much more difficult just to get through each day i mean it's already mm -hmm. becoming a challenge but uh, when it's just everything every day is all about just getting my basic needs taken care of and it takes two or three people constantly doing that then i'm i'm going to reach a point where that's kind of like okay what are we doing this for what's the point here so um, that's yeah, kind of that's kind of where my head's at. So trigger warning here. I want uh, if we go a little further with this. Uh, so you mentioned to, to me when I interviewed you for CFI about something I had not heard of called the Final Exit Network. You want to just yeah. mention what that is? Uh, yeah, it's an organization that um, kind of sponsored me for a couple of years, and we've kind of worked with them, um, talked with them, had them on my different shows, and and they're a group. Uh, it's a nonprofit based out of Oregon, uh, Gail. Um, they, they, uh, they help people take things into their own hands at the end of life, terminally ill people like me, people who are, who are, uh, not wishing to go to the bitter end. And there's the, it doesn't require you to live in a state where death with dignity is legal, which is only about eight states as far as I recall. Correct. Um, they have means that they can help you with where you can, you can have some control over when and how you bring things to an end. And that's kind of all I'll say now. If you want to know more, you can reach out to us on the website. I don't want to get into language that might trigger anyone, but okay. just, mm -hmm. just, just having what we found is that when people know they have some choices, when people know they have some control, that's a difference maker. Um, mm -hmm. And even people in the ALS community, even without a group like Final Exit, um, there are there are ways you can you can close things down that doesn't require you to go till I mean the end of ALS is pretty bad. You basically suffocate because your diaphragm, the muscles in your diaphragm don't work anymore and you can't breathe. Um, or you choke on some food because you can't swallow. And you know, those are when you're at the bitter end that you can't basically move without assistance. You you're lying there in a bed or a chair day in and day out. Uh, so that's not uh, uh, an ending that I'm interested in. And a lot of ALS people aren't. And so there's voluntarily quit eating and drinking is one me me uh, method that people use. Um, uh, and, and you know, I don't want to go too far with that, but there's ways that, mm -hmm. that we can have some control and choices in those matters. So you said, it, uh, I'll quote you, it's a lot easier to deal with something like this, a terminal illness, as an atheist than as a Christian. And for that reason... I don't factor God into it. So what advice would you give to people who are dealing with issues of life and death, health and illness as non-believers? Um, 
Uh, did I say that? It sounds yeah, yeah. Pretty profound. Uh, yeah. You are deep, Dave, like a puddle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> senti- a sentient puddle. No, a I, sentient uh, puddle. <laughs> I've, I think I've had been asked, you know, many times, what would, what do you think it would have been like if he had been diagnosed with ALS as a Christian? And my response to that is that it's a lot easier to deal with these things as, as an atheist because you don't have to factor God into it. It just is. Life just happens. There's no big plan. Yeah. There's no big orchestrated plan for your life that God had since you were formed in your mother's womb. That's all bullshit. We're here. This is the one life we have. This is it. This is the shot we have. Um, what are you going to do with it? That's the question. So to deal with a terminal illness as an atheist, it's just a matter of fact. There's no, I mean, you may get into a pity party and some do. Why me? Why this happened to me? Um, my response to that is why not me? Who am I to think I'm so special that it wouldn't be me? A, a certain number of people statistically are diagnosed with this disease and others every day. Every right. year, 5,000 people a year get ALS. I'm just one of those 5,000, and it's just random as hell. There is a genetic type that I don't have, but th- that's passed down in families, and that's really brutal because we've known of entire families that have been wiped out. Um, we, we have a young woman on our, on our board uh, of I Am Dying Out Loud that has that, that kind of gene in her family, and she's had multiple family members taken out. As an atheist, you just deal with this as this is a matter of fact thing. And as also as an atheist, because I've come to the conclusion this is the one life we have, that I'm not hoping for something beyond the grave. I'm not hoping for an eternal anything. I'm I'm a, I'm aware that this is it. And so that uh, that allows me, it almost forces me to get busy living, to focus right. on the time I have left and not sit around waiting for a pie in the sky answer that's not coming. So that's a much better approach to, in my opinion, to not only facing a terminal illness, but all of life. What are you doing? Are are you writing the story you want to write? And if not, whose fault is that? You can't blame a God. You can't blame a spiritual authority. It's you. It's on you. Write the story you want to write. And if you don't like how the story's going, tear that page up, pull out a new page, get a fresh pen and start writing a different story. And I've started, I've, I've restarted my story so many times. It's, it's crazy, but you're, it's never too late. You're never too old. And so just write it, do it, live it on your terms. That's the whole thing. What we propose is dying, living on your terms and dying on your terms, period. You're going to make me cry, Dave. I'm not going to, uh, though. I'm trying to be professional, <laughs> but like, but one thing that like, I, I, I thought I was going to be paralyzed, um, 10 years ago. Um, luckily I recovered, um, pretty much. I still have a chronic nerve pain, but I thought I was going to be paralyzed. And, um, around that time, I, because it was so scary. Um, I was like, well, I'm like this, this might be a thing that's going to happen. And ever since then, I've had this radical acceptance about anything that happens in my life. I'm like, well, it is what it is. And like, it's going to be terrible, but it is. But another thing it taught me is that um, when I'm communicating with someone, especially someone I care about, I tell them I love them because I'm always a thing in the back of my mind that we're like believers. So say, well, I get to tell my mom or whatever, yeah. when I see yeah. them in the afterlife that I love them. Right. I tell people that now that I love and appreciate them. I'm glad they're a part of my life because I don't know, I could drive to work tomorrow morning and get hit by a car or they can get hit by a car and I never get to talk to them again. So exactly. that was one, that was a lesson I learned during that right. time. And that's one of the things that I've really appreciated about you because you have framed, you know, what, what's going on in your life and this diagnosis as well. I got a little bit of time, you know, let me make the most out of it, which I Mm -hmm. really appreciated because like, I don't have a terminal illness, but I'm trying to think like, if I died today, 
what I look back and said, like, I, I, I did okay. I did the best I could. And that's kind of, I've taken on that outlook and you're a part of that outlook. So I'm going to tell you how much I appreciate that. <laughs> well, good. Thank you. That's awesome. Have you thought about what your life might've been like differently if, if you had not deconverted, deconstructed and maintained your Christianity and then got the ALS diagnosis? Yeah, I would have been, I would not have been happy at all. I, I, uh, I mean, that's what, what kind of, I kind of spoke to that earlier. It's, it's that I, I would have been trying to factor God into it. He would just thought like he was doing it to you for some reason. Yeah. Or did I have enough faith or what yeah. happened or where's, what's God plan here? And that's just, that just really muddies the water. It really yeah. makes it confusing. I mean, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard for a lot of people to come out of religion. One of the reasons is they like the idea that there's a plan and that somebody's got their back. But what I oh, don't yeah. understand is shit happens to everybody. And then, then you have to blame God essentially for, or, or yourself, as opposed to just realizing yeah. the universe is random. Yeah. It makes everything much more confusing and difficult. Honestly, it does. I, I like, I think that now that I've taken the earth, uh, the perspective of an absurdist i'm like the universe is absurd and absurd things happen to all of us and now that i've taken on that perspective i'm just like yeah the world is the world is random and it's shitty <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know and is. i'm like and i'm like yeah it's it shitty, happens. but it's also you have to kind of take responsibility as well because mm -hmm. god's not going to be there to save you you know you got to figure out how you're going to incorporate this thing into your life you know and i'm not saying it's easy or or everybody should follow the same advice but that's that's the reality of it like shit's gonna happen all the time yeah. and indeed and you you can't <laughs> yeah fact trying to factor god into it just really does make everything more difficult so when you were so um what inspired you to start dying out loud besides like the ALS <laughs> diagnosis, but like what other part, of, like, cause you could have just had ALS and just been like, okay, this is my lot. Like what inspires you to actually want to reach out and, you know, um, doing dining with dignity and, you know, um, and starting the dying out, dying out loud, you know, um, nonprofit and things like that. Like what, what led you to that? <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to, um, there was actually a friend that we were having a, I was going to just travel and as much as I could. I, my, my thought was, you know, the average is three to five years. I may have three years of good life, two years, maybe. So let's, let's mash the hammer down and do all the things I can do and, and, and go for it, you know? And I, I really did make those kind of plans at first, but then there was a, we were, I was moving out of my apartment in Nashville and some friends were there helping me. And, one of my friends said, well, what do you want to do now? And this is all in the book too, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, it is. <laughs> and I said, I don't know. What do you, what, uh, what do you mean what I want to do? And she said, you need to be talking about stuff. You are, are you, you have a, you have something to say that and a perspective that no one else has that I know of. And you, you should, I can get you. I said, well, how do I talk about this stuff? She said, I can get you on podcasts and shows. And she be, essentially became my agent. And started reaching out and um, emailing groups and and uh, uh, individuals and getting me on uh, shows like Seth Andrews and the Atheist Experience with Matt Dillahunty and I started getting speaking invitations to come speak and and then I, 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 the word kind of spread and and evidently um uh, the one thing in life I guess I can do is talk and so. Um, I, the more I started doing that, the more people started reaching out and and inviting me to do it. And then I was, I'd had a book in mind, um, but then I went ahead and wrote the book and wrote the memoir, and um, and just 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 kind of snowballed. I I really quickly found value in it. I started getting messages from people that were just really um, powerful and emotionally to read because the things they were telling me that my message had helped them with were very uh, mind blowing, honestly. And I, the more I heard from folks, the more I thought, you know what, I do need to do what I can with what I have left. And then um, the, the nonprofit I'm dying out loud. We started that this year. It was kind of an impetus of Bevan and a friend of ours, Sheila, who had a horrible experience 
in a hospital when her mom was dying with some very, very um, zealous nurse, nurses who who really intruded upon her, her last moments with her mom. And, yeah. and we were talking about that and we decided, you know what, we, we need to do something about this. We don't know if anyone is doing this, but we need to start pushing back against religious overreach in the in the world of healthcare and death and dying. And so that's where the impetus for the nonprofit came. And we, we've been, been putting that together and getting that going this week. And we've gotten an incredibly good feedback on that as well um, from individuals who've had similar experiences and other groups who, who really want to support us. And so I just find value. I, you know, I just, I don't want to just crawl up and, and um, lay down and wait to die. So I, I want to find stuff I can do that I find meaning in. No. So I have a question. So now, because you're involved in these organizations, like, um, have you butted has against like um, other organizations that, or, you know, whether it be religious or not, that don't think people should have the ability to call their own shots as they end their life that, you know, um, I'm curious if you're finding that as you're doing your work or has it been pretty much like, yeah, we do need to change. We need to um, perceive this differently, you know, um, you know, moving towards a more like, you know, you know, better future, I guess. <laughs> the best way, well, best way I, I haven't had any organizations bother me. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing is when you're when you've got a terminal illness, people they treat you a little differently. So people don't come at me as much as they might someone. Why I've do had, you come at you, Dave? That ain't huh? you, butthead. Right. <laughs> they. Uh, I've had individuals push back against um, choice with death with dignity, those kind of things, but not a lot of pushback. Uh, for one thing, I haven't. We haven't focused a lot of our attention on that particular aspect of things i i support it and i've been very upfront about that but i don't we, we're not trying to legislate you know we're not trying right. to do those things that other people are doing that well we're trying to stay in our lane and, and focus on religious intrusion in, in the healthcare realm and then uh living your best life is is the dying out loud message and so that's kind of what that's kind of what i keep keep my my head into really okay Thank you for, I was just curious, you know, because people have, you know, especially from religious groups, you know, different opinions about like, and the life care and dying. Oh, religious so groups. Was, yeah. The religious groups yeah. will definitely scream and holler that you get, you know, you can't play God and, and, and stuff Yeah. Like which that. I don't agree with at all. Yeah. So don't go Weird to the doctor that ever. Way. <laughs> all right, Rob, Rob, I'm, t I'm dominating the conversation. Ask a question. No, that's fine. Really, really, really <laughs> Good questions. So, yeah, you know, I'm. I'm wondering. Are you aware of what the rest of the, uh, say, rest of the civilized world, say Western Europe at least, uh, you know, does regarding end of life issues? Is is it is it more progressive than the U.S. is, or, or are most people there in the same boat? Yeah, it's more progressive. There are certain countries. A lot of the Scandinavian countries have very uh, progressive ideas about these things. Some of Western Europe. I really haven't studied that on um, country by country but i know that uh, there are people like one of the ladies that was is works with final exit she took her husband to um sweden god is sweden or switzerland i can't remember now oh her i always husband, get those confused oddly her her husband had als and she took him over there to so like i could, like oregon is one of the states that you can um yeah it is. And and I was talking to my husband. I was like, that's something we may want to consider because I do live in Florida and it's a cesspool. So oh, I kind of want to get out of here. But, 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 Dave, but Dave has mentioned like you need, it's very strict, the yeah. rules or something like you yeah. need to yeah. uh, that's six months away. So six month window. Yeah, that's that's yeah. not okay. Uh, well, I'm hoping by the time, unless something weird happens, that when I become an old lady <laughs> or something happens, that I'll be able to be like, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I went out. <laughs> okay, so we're getting close to doing a Q and A with the <laughs> questions that have been posted into the chat. Is there anything else we've missed that you'd like to mention, Dave? No, I'm good with Q and A now. Oh, let's oh. do the poll question results. Oh yeah, I All think right. we should do that because I want to see what people say. Kara, do you have the poll question results? 
I sure do, and I am glad to share them, and we especially need to to get to the answer for the second one. So I will I will read the results that we got. So the first question was, oh wait, I'm not sharing them, sorry. Okay, now you should be able to see them. The first question was, what do you say to people who tell you life is meaningless without God? And 17% of folks answered, go fuck yourself. Uh, 59%, by far the largest group, uh, selected you choose your own meaning. 7% said there is no meaning in life. 3% said they would turn it around on the person asking and ask what kind of meaning do you think God gives to life. And 14% of people said that none of the above or something else. So as a, as a co-host, I'm not allowed to vote in the poll, but uh... Uh, I have been asked that by by co-workers who are very religious and my family. And I've done different things there, but I never said, go fuck yourself. But <laughs> depending on the person, I said some of the other things, yeah. I'm glad that got 70%, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I always, I've said like, that I, one. <laughs> it's my ex, my existentialist, existentialist self that I'm like, we, we, we're all choosing our own meeting. I, so Because so, even religious people are doing the same thing. You're just choosing yeah. this particular that, that, That's kind of the, the route I went down yeah. on. I said, would you yeah. like to live in North Korea where the government... I don't really know about North Korea, but let's assume that's the kind of, that's the policy there, where they decide what you're going, what school you're going to go to as a child, and what career you're going to have. And would you like that for them to choose a meaning in your life? No. Well, then why is it okay for this celestial dictator to decide that when you don't even get it in writing? You're just assuming something anyway. It's, it's so weird. <laughs> You get a voice in your head that says yeah. like, yes, this, yeah. you're supposed to be blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, Dave, how would you answer this question? Oh, I would uh, turn it around and ask them, what kind of meaning do you think God gives to life? And I've that seen would, you do that, Dave. Yeah, <laughs> and that, that would, because most people, most Christians say blanketly, God gives meaning to life, but if you pin them on it, ask them, what what is that meaning? Describe that for me. They're going to have a hard time coming up with it. And then you've got, right. and then you've got a conversation there that could or, be, or, or even how did you get it in writing from God? Do you have to, uh, no, I just thought about it. Well, then you came up with it. Stop it. <laughs> well, okay. And then we have our second question, which is which of these things did Dave Warnock not do when he was a pastor? <laughs> and to recap, the answer choices were play golf, which got 31% of the responses play guitar got 10 percent hmm. masturbate 45 percent <laughs> selected oh, that wow. one and then 14 percent of people chose go fishing so dave which of those things did you not do i'm drum when you were a pastor <laughs> well i was a good good christian man i wouldn't touch myself that way uh no i um the the correct answer is go fishing so that one got least, no, play guitar was the least. Uh, we should have added, I think we maybe talked about it. One other answer would have been admit to masturbating. Because uh, all the people masturbate, but nobody admits to it. That would have been more fair. And then That's you'd be true. lying. And and every time you masturbate, baby Jesus cries. <laughs> So. Yeah, baby Jesus doesn't like when you touch yourself. No, he doesn't like that's, it. That's weird that baby Jesus is even involved in that. But I, oh, he's I sitting don't in the know. corner watching, man. What are you talking about? Mm. I don't know. That is folks. not a kink I want to be a part he's of. He's a bit pervy of. Yeah, it's a three way I don't want any part of. Mm -mm. I know, let's move to Q and A. Let's do that. Let's do that, y'all. Get the questions. We've got a lot of questions, so we'll get through as many as we can. Okay. Rob, All right, wanna... since you're already talking, you oh. can do a question and then hand off you, to me. You Rob. go first. Oh, all yeah, right. Okay, first. I'll go first. And I, I'm curious about this one too. The first question that we got was wondering, Dave, if you have seen the Jesus Revolution on Netflix, and if you have any reaction to it, since it sounds like you lived through some of that. You know, I looked at the preview of that and um, I was telling Bevan, I was watching it. I said, I, I don't need to watch this. I lived it. I know. I know these people, that pastor, Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel in California. He was baptizing the Jesus freaks in the ocean. I've been to his church. I, I know that story and, and I know those people. And I thought, I don't need to watch this. I, I know. I know how this goes. And it's it's going to it's going to glamorize all that jesus freak fervency that i 
lived in and know to be complete horseshit. So I had not heard of this documentary before. Is, is this pro the religion or like? Oh yeah, yeah. Religion? It's kind of glamorizing the whole Jesus movement wow. and how this oh. this this okay. uh, this wow. stayed stuck in stuck in his ways. Pastor saw these hippies coming into his church and the old people didn't like it. And he opened his door to the barefoot, long haired hippies and it changed his life and it sparked this revolution. And yeah, yeah, it's, uh, has, has anyone done a documentary from the perspective? Okay. Everyone knows there's a flat earth movement. There are people I actually believe this. Some people are posed, but some people I've talked believe. to them, but there are, <laughs> there are documentaries and there's really a good one. It's called behind the curve. It examines why people believe this BS. Has anyone done one in the Christian movement in that way? No, I don't know if they've done that. They should. I think there's been books written about it. That would be fantastic. Because they, they've done cults like, you know, um, yeah. like IBLP and Scientology and Mormonism, but they haven't really done one on the, like mm. the whole Jesus movement, mm -hmm. you know, during the 70s, which mm -hmm. I always say like in the 1960s and 1970s, everybody was looking for a guru, yeah. you know, and they just mm -hmm. took their parents' set of shitty rules and applied it. <laughs> You know, Ooh, so we had somebody else. who would give a talk who is a documentary maker and she's making documentaries. I think we should give her this idea. Yeah, we're going to meet her next week, actually. Right. She's <laughs> she going to be about... at the excursion. Right. That yeah. was Lindsay. You guys yes. need to put your heads together and have her do this. We'll, we'll have to bring that up. Yeah. But I, right, I mean, you want to go next, like Robbie? You want to go? I'll go. Okay. So someone asked Dave, how many times did you say the sinner's prayer, which I'm not even sure what that is, by the way, as a Catholic, just to make sure you got it right? I only said it once and I, you know, but I was baptized two different times. So, so what, what, by the way, what is that for us? Non uh, yeah, I have no idea what that is. It's <laughs> basically admitting that you're a sinner and lost without Jesus. And you ask him to forgive you of your sins and come into your heart and make you a new man. That's what it's called. It's okay. like the Apostles' Creed. Okay, no, it's not like that. No, but it's like no. what you say to get saved. It, it's the it's, thing oh, that you have to do to get saved. Creed. And if you don't do it to right, make you born again. Yeah, yeah. If you didn't really mean it, or didn't yeah. mean it enough, or or didn't say it right, there there can be this nagging fear in the back of your head that you're not really saved. So I have to tell you the story. I've never mentioned this out loud anywhere. When I was a teenager, and my whole family had converted to fundies. And except for my immediate family, so all my extended family did. We were at my cousin's house. And my aunt, who was one of the big people converting people, gave me a piece of paper with something on it. And too long ago, I was like 15 or 16. And it said, I accept the Lord Jesus as, as, into my life and as my savior. I didn't know that they had a name. And that's what that was. And yeah, and they please. they all, they wanted me, first they said, read this. And I started reading it. No, no, no. You have to read it out loud for it to work. Okay. <laughs> it's a magic spell. So I read it out loud. And they're looking at me like they expected like lightning to come out of my oh, head yeah. and hit me or something. And nothing happened. They go, Maybe you have to sleep on it first. That's actually what happened. So that was the <laughs> sinner's prayer. Okay. Yep. Now I have a name I, for that. This is not a thing that I ever heard of. Uh, like, yeah. I feel like I'm almost disappointed because like a lot of people in like the atheist circles that have come from funding religions, there's not a lot of Catholics floating around. And I'm just like, I didn't go through this. <laughs> no. I feel Different like there's world. a whole world of fucked up shit that I did not get to be a part of. So it's it's no surprise to me that my <laughs> the aunt who did that was before, and this was just like a year before, before they became fundamental Christians. And she wasn't really into Catholicism at all. She wasn't, but she was into Ouija boards and crystals and stuff like that. So it oh, does not surprise that. me <laughs> that she thought this was like a magic spell that I would just read this thing and it would convert me instantly. So if oh, you yeah. said it wrong, like, it, like, even if you believed and like Jesus was going to save your soul, like if you said it wrong, that did not mean that Jesus was very, um, like very particular how this prayer, that's this prayer was said that if you didn't say it correctly, he would be like, ah, no, it's not, it's not exact. So no, no we really didn't have, it. we didn't have a formulaic uh, prayer, okay. basically just covering the basis. 
Yeah, I felt like, uh, Dave, I had more of a similar uh, religious experience to you. I went to a charismatic evangelical school growing up, yeah, and uh, I got convinced. I, I got kind of coerced into doing the sinner's prayer the first time when I was five. I was, I was legit tricked. I was told that if I did the sinner's prayer, I would then get to, we would read the storybook after that, and, and there would be story time, and I just <laughs> wanted to have story time. And then I was tricked um. after I did the prayer that story time did not even happen, so it started what? off on a bad foot. But, did you do as a five-year-old well that's a whole other you're question just born you're, into, you're born, you're born into into it. in nature yeah that is you're true. going and to hell no matter sin. what yeah. but this then is because why you need of to get that baptized you're born when you're a baby. Yeah. yeah but because <laughs> of that i was later convinced that <laughs> if i didn't really mean the sinner's prayer when i said it the first time it didn't really count so if uh, i felt that i was tricked into it then I, I didn't do it. So if, if you're, it wasn't so much that you didn't say the right words, but if your heart wasn't right, mm -hmm, then mm -hmm. it, it didn't really count. That, that right. was my experience. So, that's so they, why it's clear now, Kara. That's yeah. what happened. Yeah. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't mean it. <laughs> Turns out it didn't take. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see who's I'm up. Gonna, Helen, is it your turn? I'm up. Okay. Go. So, all right. I'm going to put on my serious face. Okay, deconstruction is a term I'm hearing a lot from ex, ex evangelicals, media content creators. How much awareness of this deconstruction terminology and process is there within the ev evangelical community? Is it seen as a looming threat or mostly ignored? I've heard uh, of the last couple of years, I've heard more and more of them talking about it and i do think they see it as a threat although i've seen clips of some of them dismissing it as some like one guy said uh, i saw a girl that did a tiktok a, a, a woman not a girl that did a tiktok on uh someone she played a clip of some pastor saying oh deconstruction's the sexy thing to do and so she played off of That's that hot. and made it, made it <laughs> no brain. she she did she's I'm so, you know, she started using all these words and trying to, <laughs> and doing like hot, hot moves. And, uh, and it was just uh, hilarious. I, like, that's put a my, link, put like, a link. I want like to see deconstruction this. Deconstruction is my king. It, it was hilarious. And uh, somebody put a link in the chat. There, there are some, uh, there are some evangelicals taking notice of it because it's affecting them. It's affecting their attendance. And more than anything, it's going to affect the money. And uh, that's when it will get serious for them but they're they're starting to take notice that it's a legitimate issue in their world okay all right well. i'm just thinking of like um faith plus one that south park episode where like carbon um started that christian rock band and replaced all the love songs oh, yeah. <laughs> with like yeah. jesus <laughs> <laughs> and then it got weird <laughs> they go but it's great and, and it's wonderful like if you have those of you who have not seen that episode i recommend <laughs> yeah but, but there, so, so to, yeah, it's come up uh, numerous times and i've never asked this before so let me ask it now i had never heard the word deconstruction until i joined rfr and then everyone seems to know it people stepping out of religion who call me on the phone they use the word it must be all over the internet or something i mean is this a fairly new thing or that i just was oblivious to it when i came out like 30 years you're, ago. you're just oblivious rob um yeah, okay <laughs> no it wasn't a thing it wasn't a thing when i came out either i didn't i mean but i think it's an apt term because yeah, if, yeah. You, if you look at constructing your faith essentially it's deconstructing your faith to see what all's there so i i have a good you know my uh years ago our house burned down and we had to take when you when you have that experience you 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 have to deconstruct what's left right words, pull it down to the bare walls if you will how did that happen and see you read the book rob no and, no uh, rob it's <laughs> in the book <laughs> you need to read the book rob have all, all the answers to all your questions you are read audible. the fucking book um everybody uh, gets Dave's book but Listen, if you uh, get Dave's book, a fair, uh, fairy, a gay fairy gets their wings. It's just like, just so yeah. I mean, get the book. <laughs> it's a fair term because I could see, you know, you you're you're deconstructing what you believe and why you believe it, and and then the idea is to get it down to the foundation, to the bare bones, and see what's left, 
and then see what you want to build back uh, of, of any kind of faith or spirituality or what, what your, what your worldview will look like in terms of faith or non-faith. And I think that's a good way to put it. Now I've heard it also said that deconstruction is different from deconversion. And I think that's true. Mm -hmm. Also you're deconstructing your faith and you get to a point like I did where you deconvert, you, you no longer identify as a Christian. And so by, by that mm. definition, I have deconverted from my faith in God. Because like I've I've mm. talked to people like even within the pagan circles that they have left organized religion, but yeah. they have some form of this was what I did some form yeah. of spirituality yeah. and but they're but they're willing to be a little bit more skeptical about it, which I think is more intellectually honest yeah. than um, being like dogmatic about it, you know. Versus the de deconversion where like myself where i was like this is all bs i have no justification exactly yeah you know so i think that and i think that's a healthy even within people that are spiritual at least be intellectually honest about it rather than doubling down saying that like this is the only way you know if they can come to a place like i want to believe this and it makes me feel better but i may not be right and i think that's more intellectually honest than saying mm -hmm. being very dogmatic about it yeah i agree yeah okay so there's a question in the chat and uh i'm afraid apparently that Jesus dave, dave is Asian. just gonna say <laughs> dave is just gonna say buy the book but <laughs> let me ask it anyway uh someone wants to know um do you have advice for overcoming the fear of hell even though i don't logically believe in it i was taught to fear hell before i was taught critical thinking this is such a common thing by the way i hear this all the time and the fear has stuck around i'm a fundamentalist evangelical i'm from a fundamentalist evangelical bible literalist denomination also so i hope they're still here uh no that's not in the book so i'm happy to answer that um no i the the fear of hell is I understand I, I didn't grow up with, you know, the fear of hell um, indoctrinated into me. I, I I learned of it later. So I didn't have that pounded into me as a child, which is damaging because it it impresses itself there before you have the ability to cognitively think about such a concept. That's the horrible thing about teaching a child about hell. Um what I think people have to do with with that, if that fear of hell is in, is lodged there, is just work through that with therapy and recognize that it's an illogical concept that's been implanted in you and not, you know, not give place to it. It's it's easier said than done. I know people who full grown adults who still wake up in night sweats with fear of hell as though it's a real thing that's going to get them. And they know cognitively it's not a thing. They know it's not. And so it's just a fear of death in hell is, is you know, fear of death I consider to be different than the fear of hell. A fear of hell is a more of a spiritual um, indoctrination. A fear of death can be a very common to mankind uh, issue. You can, you, it's not related to religion necessarily. It can be, but not necessarily. I think a fear of death is just another thing that we have in our head that we really haven't thought through if we if we i tell people if we if we pause and think through the concept of dying of death what is it that we're actually afraid of well we're actually afraid of not living anymore we're actually afraid of what's after death we're actually afraid of not knowing what's after death or we're actually afraid of the event of dying what's that going to look like is it going to be painful is it going to be uh difficult you know how am i going to die when am i going to die all these unanswered questions can be wrapped up in this whole concept of of fear of death and if we look at death as just simply the the natural result of living and something that we will all experience then we can kind of take the mystery out of it to some degree and just say, it's just, I'm just going to go to sleep one day and I'm not going to wake up. And I won't know that I'm not awake. I won't know that I'm not anything. I won't know. Right. Anything. There'll be no consciousness there. That's my best understanding of it. I don't know, but that's what I'm thinking is going to happen. And so 
rather than saying I'm afraid of death, we could say I'm afraid of not living. I'm afraid of missing out. I'm afraid of of my life not continuing and what that means. And then those are things we can do something about. Like I said before, then we can get busy living. Then we can write our story. Then we can focus on giving attention to those who are in our lives and not neglecting the things that are important, not missing out on the things we want to do. So those are the things we can do something about. We can't do anything about what happens after death. So it doesn't serve us to spend much time thinking about that. Well, sir. there's a song by Tom Waits. Um, it's called Time by uh, by um, Tom Waits. And the, the song is completely about like wanting more time because yeah. it's, it's and basically that's what death is, is that um, I want more time. And it turns me into a weepy, weepy mess every time I listen to it. But it's uh, like a song on my funeral playlist, <laughs> you know, that yeah. I added to because it encapsulates that feeling of like, I'm not afraid of death as itself. Like, I just don't want it to be, you know, awful. Yeah. But, but it's really that I'm not, I'm losing time. I'm losing time of living. And yeah. that's, and that's what we're really, really, really afraid of, you know, uh, because might- when you're dead, you don't have an awareness that you're missing time. <laughs> Who had the famous quote that I, I wasn't alive for billions of years before I was born and it didn't bother me at all and it'll be the same after? I've heard that, yeah, several. That's what my I oldest think that said gets to attributed to um, the same person. A bunch of quotes get attributed. Mark to Twain. Is it Mark, Mark Twain? Twain. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if that's actually who that's said it or right. not, but right. I've right. I've seen him credited with. Yeah, that. he's credited <laughs> with a lot. Well, I saw I, I saw I, Abraham Lincoln credited with uh, something like 75.3 percent of the things on the internet are incorrect. So. Like other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, other uh, a couple of the quotes I've I've heard that are funny and poignant both. But one is funny. He says, "What's gonna? What do you think happens after you die?" And, and he says, "Plenty, but I just won't be there." And then, mm-hmm. uh, and the other one, I saw a clip from Keanu Reeves being interviewed by Stephen Colbert, and Colbert. I love was, that quote. Colbert so was kind of kind of trying to play a gotcha thing, I think. And he said, Keanu, what do you think happens after you die? And Keanu paused a minute and then he got thoughtful. And he said, well, I know the people who love us will miss us. Hmm. Hmm. Is Keanu an out atheist? I, I think know. he is. I think he, I don't think he's an out atheist, but I think he is at least agnostic. Yeah. Um, he's he probably hasn't... not a man of faith because yeah. <laughs> Colbert's, a, you know, renowned Catholic. And he's, yeah, yeah. It comes he's up with a little but... He's he trying also... to do a little gotcha. He's trying to do a little gotcha there, and Kiana threw, and then <laughs> and Colbert was like, "Oh, wow!" And the you know the audience really applauded. And the thing is, though, he is a Catholic, but he makes fun of religion all the time. Yeah, so which I, clings, I really appreciate about him. That, he clings to that label with yeah, every, and I, I think being. it's I think it gives him comfort, but also the thing <sighs> I'm just I'm I might be doing pop psychology, and I admit that, <laughs> but right. I think that it's a way for him to feel comforted um, when he dies, but also he kind of makes fun of it enough that he thinks it's absurd. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, so that was a really good answer on that subject. And if the person who is here, who said, who asked the question about overcoming the fear of hell, I want them to make sure you saw it. I'll put it in the chat again. We have quite a few resources uh, on recovering from religion on this subject because it is a very common thing yeah. yes. that people deal with. Yeah. So it's very common. And we've got a couple of more questions. Uh, Dave, do you have time to answer? Uh, yeah, a couple more than I have a biology break coming up and I'm getting No, tired, we, we so got we'll two questions absolutely. and we can take it into our clothes. Okay. So, absolutely. All right, Helen, you want to field the next yes. one? All right. Can you speak of any of the disorienting feelings you have experienced upon leaving the faith? And or how long it took you to reach a place of acceptance regarding your religious past? Um, yeah, I had a lot of disoriented feelings, uh, leaving the faith because I felt very alone and, and didn't understand. It was not something I chose. I wasn't looking to toss my faith aside. I was trying to cling to it. My whole world revolved around it. And I wasn't wanting to shake that up for no reason, but I just had to ask the questions and it took me down that road. And that's why I ended up. So it left me very disoriented and confused, and it took me several years to find my equilibrium, 
to find my tribe, to find my voice. Um, it's not easy. There weren't groups like this. There weren't groups like the Clergy Project, which was my first connection with former clergy who no longer believe. Um, it took me a while to find people who'd gone through the same thing, both online and in person. And so now some of my best friends in life are the people who've been through this. Uh, we get each other like no one else does. And it and it and it informs everything we do and all the ways we think. And so even when I try to connect with atheist groups who weren't former Christians, who weren't formerly fundamentalist, I don't have the same connection. We don't get each other. We don't have yeah. that same bonding that that I have with the former faithful that I've gotten to know. Well, all right. Rob, do you want to bring us into our last question? And then we can, so this way Dave can go to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, uh, the last question is, oh, this is a big one. What advice do you have for people who can't decide what to do with their life? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it's all about that purpose and meaning thing we were talking about, isn't it? Things um, like that. Yeah, it doesn't it's, say, it, but I, maybe this person thought they had a meaning connected to the religion and now that's Well, different. what to do with your life, that's a big one. And it's not something that I think has to be decided tonight or tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. Or it changes all the fucking time. <laughs> it, it is. It's just live yeah. your life. It's just write your story. Like I said earlier, just start writing your story. Live the life you want to live, not dictated by anyone else, not di dictated by religious authority, by a family member by anybody it's you a spouse a friend what do you want your life to be what do you want your story to be and then start writing it and and give yourself permission to change it as many times as you want to as many times as you need to i'm no therapist i'm just shooting off the hip here but you asked me so i'm answering that. um it it's just your life and and one of the things Christianity does, I think, a big disservice to us, among others, is that it it tells us we have to have this big plan. We have to have this thing mapped out. We have to have it figured out. And a lot of society does that, too. You're supposed to go to college, get a degree, and come out of there at 22 or 23 knowing what you want to do for the rest of your life. You're supposed to get married to a spouse and be with that person the rest of your life. And you don't even know if you're going to like them five years from now, if they're going to like you five years from now. Why do we put ourselves in these boxes? Why do we paint ourselves in these corners? Just fucking live your life and, and let it flow. And if it's, and, and I'll say it again, change it as many times as you need and do not apologize for changing it. You may be an architect and 20 years down the road, you say, I hate this shit. I hate doing this every day. I'm going to paint. I'm going to write. And you may starve doing it, but do it. You've got one life. You get one shot at this. This is not a dress rehearsal. And you're the one that gets to author your life. And, and you don't have to answer to anyone. You don't have to apologize to anyone. It's your life. And and I I just, I'm, a, I'm just going to advocate for that till I don't have any life left. To be fair, you can live your life as an ADHD person and your life is just going to fucking change all the time anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so Kara wrote this evening's takeaway quote just fucking live your life great yeah we're gonna words to live that seems by. To be on a bumper sticker <laughs> all right well thank you Dave for being here um I love talking to you like I really do you're thank such you. a like wonderful speaker and you're such a kind giving person that it, like I, I was so excited that you're gonna be here this week so thank you for being here my pleasure always yeah, I'm, so, I'm, gonna see I'm, you I'm at glad the, that they let me. I can't. I'm going to give you a big hug next so week. We're going to have yes. Yes. and pictures we had, next week. Yes, all everyone wanted to co-host the episode that you yeah, were we on were because everyone over loves Dave oh. so much. It was well, it's just I love I love you guys. I love RFR and all that it stands for. I'm excited to be at the excursion next weekend. My um, husband wants to give uh, you a big hug, also big as well. hugs all we're around. Gonna, yeah, we're um, going to give each other hugs and pictures, and it's going to be wonderful. Any of you. Any of you that haven't been to the excursion, you you don't want to miss it. It's sold out. We'll keep selling out. Daryl says we're going to sell out. Over Get a B and B. But Get a tent. <laughs> it's, it's so impactful. You meet amazing people from all over the country, 
And I was there a couple of years ago and loved every minute of it. So really excited to be back this year. I'm so excited. I, like again. it was just like the icing on the proverbial cake. So, you know, I'm very happy. It's going to be a wonderful time. If you can come, um, there are, there are wonderful Airbnbs around where we're going to be. So you can hang out there, come mm -hmm. and do like the, you know, come to the lectures, you know, come for trivia night, whatever it is. Like we would love to have you. So if you can, if you can make it, we would love to have you there. So because Dave's going to be there. Well, all of us are going to be there. And we're amazing, too. So, you know. <laughs> okay, okay, Robbie, you want to um, get this close going? <laughs> well, just to say again, yes, um, I'm so uh, thankful that uh, you were able to do this again. And I got to speak with you again and hope we can in the future. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. This okay, back to Kara. Lovely. Yes. Okay. We'll go ahead and do our wrap up now. Again, thank you so much, Dave. And we will be back again next week. Same time, same channel. We have John, John Gleason, Gleason, the godless engineer who we are super excited to have. Uh, he'll be here next week. That's going to be a lot of fun. Don't forget to join us. And if you need more RFRX in your life between now and then, because who doesn't, check us out on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts and you can watch previous episodes or listen to previous episodes on there and if you have any questions or comments or ideas for future shows things you'd like to see you can email us at rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org and don't forget to check out all of the other great content on our blog or our podcast and and we have to that, social media right we're all yes. on the social media we have a uh, we're on Facebook, of course, which is Recovering From Religion. No spaces, no hyphens. And there's also a Facebook support group, which is RFR Support Groups Project on Facebook. And we're also on the uh, the thing formerly known as Twitter, which still is twitter.com slash RFR org. So I'm confused about that. It's X, but they haven't changed their URL yet. It's still Twitter. Uh, we're on Instagram and we're also, uh, believe it or not, on TikTok. Okay, so that we're going to launch correct. the final poll, which yes. I'm going to read, and then uh, we will move on from there. So, uh, okay, so this program was relevant to me. One, no, this is fucking stupid. I hated it. It's terrible. Five, yes, this was the most amazing program that I've ever been to, and it was super relevant, and it was awesome. And then two to four, search your feelings. Number two, the speaker was clear and understandable. One, banana phone talking into tin cans between two elementary school students. It was terrible. Could not understand. Five, perfectly. It was like the person was standing right next to me. It was awesome. Two to four, search your feelings or adjust your volume and audio controls on your computer or however you're listening to us. Number three, I will definitely attend future programs like this. W one, I will not attend. This was terrible. Fuck you all. Number five, yes, I will be back. This was amazing. You have the best content ever. Two to four, again, search your feelings. It depends on the topic. Mm, depends on my mood, which is perfectly valid. Number four, how did you find about find RFR X night? One, through the, our awesome, you got through the velvet rope and you heard about it on the RFR online community or Slack channel. Two, the meetup event. Number three, Facebook, tw um, Twitter, also known as X or the Instagram through the Discord, the RFR website or other, which is, I would assume a bird landed on your shoulder <laughs> and told you God to told join them. us. God told them to join the RFR meeting. <laughs> Helen, birds aren't real. <laughs> That's true. I'm too. sorry. Okay. I'm mocking Jay. <laughs> told you to join us. <laughs> Okay, now that I went through that, let's say hi to Daryl, who's going to give his closing thoughts and prayers for the stock. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I only have one prayer, and I don't think it's appropriate for tonight. It's the Apostrophian sex prayer. I think you've heard that one before. But I'll, we'll uh, forego with the prayers tonight. Uh, but I just said, Dave, uh, thank you so much. I know Dave's probably had to leave us, but I hope he can hear this. Uh, I love Dave's book. I, I get... I don't know, one or two manuscripts a month. People wanting me to look, read them and endorse them and everything. I 
couldn't possibly read them all, certainly wouldn't endorse them all. So when Dave, when Dave's came over my uh, desk, I, uh, I, I was skeptical, obviously. I wasn't sure if it was going to be a good book or not. But within two or three chapters, I was hooked. And um, it, it's an excellent book. Uh, between I tell Okay, I'm going to buy the book tonight. <laughs> and I'm going to download it. I'm going to download it. Do you have an I, Audible credit you can use, Rob? <laughs> no, I have to sign in. I have a free account, but I'll do it just to I get the damn book. I had to buy mine too, to be fair, because Carr endorsed it, and we were like, okay. And then I, I had a lot of feelings, but that's okay. Sorry, Daryl, you go ahead. It's, Sorry, it's, it's, it's well worth it. And hearing Dave read, it's probably better. I didn't read; I read it the real, the old-fashioned way. So anyway, well, let so me just I say, wanna, I, I want to say about that. Uh, I'll jump back in. I heard you, Daryl. Um, I sent it to Daryl and then I was terrified. I was like holding my breath for the next few days. And then I got a call from him and I, I thought, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And, but, but I realized he'd only had it a few days and I thought, oh, well, he read it pretty quick then. So either he really hates it or really likes it. And he, he, he calls me up and he says, I said, hey, and I was just so nervous and he said are you ready for a call from a fan <laughs> and oh I, nice then i realized oh, that's oh, so nice i was so relieved i was so relieved well it is for a, that thank you for that you're, you're you're welcome it is a big risk to write a book and everybody and their dog anybody who writes books thinks there's the best book on the planet so when you say no it's not that's pretty uh devastating yeah. So I, I know how it, I, I've written four books. I know what it's like for people to say, yeah, no. Anyway, uh, I, I just want to move on to one, one thing, and that is the uh, Dying Out Loud nonprofit. Dave came to me sometime back, I don't know, it's been a year or so, and we talked, actually, it's been a couple of years, hadn't it? So yeah. Maybe more. You well, we talked idea. about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I, and the minute I heard about it, I thought, this is great. This is worth supporting. And I, uh, so I've been supporting this from their beginning. RFR has been supporting, the board has been supportive. We think uh, there's a big need to challenge religiosity in our healthcare system, especially not just around death and dying, but I, I went to the hospital this week, as some of you know, mm -hmm. after taking a weird fall that I didn't expect. And, you know, first thing they asked me almost is, what's your religious preference? And I, <laughs> I'm saying out loud in front of everybody in the waiting room, atheist. Um, I'm, I'm not <laughs> a, and, now, a, a year or two ago, I had a, another hospital visit, and they didn't even have the category. They, they didn't have a place for atheists in, in their computer system. Uh. Now, it, it was a different hospital than this one, but I'm just saying, a year, two years ago, I had to, they put other, because there wasn't any place for me. So this time, I go and I say, atheist, oh, yeah, but she just checked the box, and we were good. So there's, I don't know if that's progress. I don't know if they've just recently added it or not, but that's, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, it is good. That's a that's a tiny progress. And then I went ahead and said, please don't be sending any chaplains to my room. They won't they won't like that. So, mm -hmm. And they the, and the other people laughed. And then one person said, yeah, if they come to my room, I'm kicking them out too. <laughs> and and that was one of the staff members. Oh, oh, it was the security guard. I'm sorry. That <laughs> was kind of that was kind of funny. But we want to be challenging people. I go to the hospital several years ago, and I got a room, and I got a damn crucifix in my room. I want to get up and rip it off the wall. In fact, I did. I got up and tried to rip it off the wall, and I realized they really nailed that sucker down. <laughs> he had nails, well, real nails. He, <laughs> he was nailed. He was nailed. He, he was absolutely nailed. <laughs> so uh, anyway. That sounds kinky. Is, it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, you Catholics, you you are born and raised in in kink. I'm I'm envious of you in some ways, but yeah. So uh, anyway, we are very supportive of this. We want to challenge, as you know, we challenge we're challenging the culture in a number of ways. Yeah, and one of which is is in this in this way. So uh, I love it, and even even without that, or even in a as a big part of what Dave's doing, uh, I love what he says that dying out loud makes you think if you openly admit to yourself and say right out loud, like Dave is doing, I'm dying. All of us are dying. <laughs> I don't care how old you are. You're still dying. Mm -hmm. So let's live today. And that's what, that's what Dave's doing a great job. He's making all of us think about how we want to take ownership and authorship. I love that word authorship. I'm the author of my life. 
-hmm. and I'm going to write each of, of these chapters. So um, if you like what we're doing here to, tonight, I hope you'll think, consider donating, uh, make a, a monthly donation to Recover from Religion to help support what we're doing here. And if you really want to, and here's the deal, if you really, really want to create meaning and purpose in your life, volunteer for RFR. We will help you create meaning and purpose in your life. Uh, or you might want to don't you might want to donate or volunteer for dying out loud, but I wouldn't want to say that too loud here anyway. So mm -hmm. that is oh yeah, and Dave's going to be at the excursion. So if you want to get more of Dave and get more of a whole lot of other uh, interesting people, it'd be uh, great. Go, go sign up. And back to you, Kara. All I got to right. bounce. Love being here. Got to bounce, y'all. Thanks, guys. All right, let me game, Dave. We'll Take see care. you at the excursion. See you next week.